to this open session of the external engagement committee i am suresh babu chair of the committee we'll go through a quick roll call of all the other members of this external engagement committee um dario gill you know be here roger bichi present marine kandey present ken fox yeah be there heather wilson here okay thank you are there other board members present looks like nobody there so also with us our nsb staff who support the committee nadine alam and riva bandavatiya as well as nsb's triple as science and engineering policy fellows alexander sarsal and daniel elgar um before we turn into our first agenda item i'd like to remind us all that this is an open meeting and members of the public are watching on youtube particularly when we get out to our last agenda of the item to discuss the honorary awards i would ask you to please refrain from mentioning any specific names or groups as though so are confidential that includes this year's public service awardees who will be publicly announced in the spring so first on our agenda is the approval of the minutes from our december meeting are there any changes to the meeting minutes of the meeting of the minutes anything anybody else i'm hearing not seeing one? yeah no <laughs> not seeing any hands hearing no corrections the minutes stand approved as presented and uh any if there's no corrections we can move on to the next agenda item and uh, the next is uh, um as you know the board released the 2022 state of the us science and engineering indicators report on january 18th and we have held five virtual briefings since then a press briefing a brief briefing for the white house especially ostp and omb and briefing for senate and house science committee staff a briefing of the science and engineering community in which over 500 attendees from across the country turned in representing universities science and higher education associations industry federal agencies and congressional staff and a briefing of the department of state uh, big thanks to science and engineering policy committee chair julia phillips for the tremendous amount of energy and time she put into these efforts along with nsv chair elena chawa and then the nc ses team led by the program director amy burke and our nsb scp and ee staff thank you also to director panchanathan for joining us for the public webinar and the white house briefings the media coverage indicators to date is in your board book you can see that in addition we have had six state radio interviews so far in new york illinois ohio minnesota michigan and texas in which julia ellen and dan reed roger beachy and heather wilson participated i think the radio audio files are too big uh, to be uh, broadcast through diligent if you are interested please send a request to nadine and she can send you the mpg files more media pieces are in progress including an article for nasdaq.com authored by dan an article for ecampusnews.com which i am authoring and possibly nasdaq tv interview with the victor looking ahead we will brief the national institute of standards and technology in early march and reach out to offer briefings to the department of energy congressional research service aau aplu and others julia phillips will also be leading briefings for committees of the national academies later in march indicators and nsb keystone policy brief will also figure in the discussion at march 2nd round table between ellen and panch and university of texas academic leaders thanks to heather for making this round table possible in addition indicators and nsb keystones brief will be part of the nsb meeting with congressional officers in march nsb staff will reach out to some of you soon to check out on your interest and availability so that they can get these meetings scheduled and prepare for the memos and background materials for the board members so uh, let me pass uh, if there is any questions or comments on this uh, state, state of the indicators report out outreach 
and any other engagement effects so far on the upcoming plans. Let me pass. Any so Rush, I just wanted to let you know, Matt Malcolm has also joined your meeting. Hello, Matt. Thank you for joining us. So appreciate it. Uh, we were just going through the indicators report rollout and engagement also, and you might have seen it in the uh, board book also. Any uh, questions and comments or discussions on that? Hearing none, uh, we'll mo keep moving forward. Uh, before we move on, I wanted to flag that included in your board book is our current NSB congressional delegation list. And when you get a moment, please uh, take a look at it and let Nadine and Reba know if you know any members of Congress beyond your own senators and representative. This information will give us a more complete picture what opportunities uh, we can seize. And I also asked the full board to do this during my e report out in the February board meeting. So uh, let's turn to the third agenda item in front of us. Um, as you know, NSB external pa panelists continues to help from both the board, NSF, and other science and engineering decision makers by sharing the data about Vision 2030 priorities. We started uh, with a year long focus on topics related to missing millions in STEM and recently shifted to another vision priority, expanding the geography of innovation. Before we discuss other potential panels for our May and August meetings, I'd like to ask uh, Dario and Roger, I believe they are here or not. Uh, Dario is not here. Roger, Roger is here. Roger is here to give us an update on February's panel, uh, which they have organized. Roger, can you give us an update, please? Thanks, uh, uh, Suva. I, I will do so a, a bit, and then I'll, add, then I'll turn to Alexandra to give uh, more of the details of the individuals involved. We had a, a very robust uh, challenge in front of us as we asked for the, this, the upcoming panel. And uh, true to form, we had some wonderful, uh, some very useful names that came forward as potential speakers for the panel. All of those have, have agreed. Um, we've had dry runs for each of them and we are looking forward to a, a really fine discussion. We have a little bit more time this time for the, at, at this session for questions and answers. And uh, our, our focus is on uh, examples of of interactions that that uh, create uh, that have been successful, and uh, are exemplars of the kind of, of local interactions that happen in under different contexts. Uh, from from um, how does a community work together to create an, an innovation center or create entrepreneurism and innovation followed by entrepreneurism, and uh, and what are the examples? Uh, what how do those work compared to other examples that we have seen? Uh, uh, that for example, the uh, response to the new challenge of of the COVID nineteen um, research, the need for research and to understand that disease and and um, how to treat it and so forth. Uh, Alexandra, would you like to give us some, would you give a summary please? I don't have it in front of me, I apologize team for uh, not having that list in front of me to, to present to you. So you have more um, in, in, important and uh, other updated information. So Alexandra, hate to put you on the spot, but I wonder if you could do that for us, please. Yeah, absolutely, um, no problems. So we have four panelists uh, scheduled for the panel next week. The first is Simon Johnson, who is a, an economist out of MIT. He is a co-author of Jumpstarting America, How Breakthrough Science Can Revive Economic Growth in the American Dream. And um, he does a really good job um, in the dry run. He did a really good job of uh, talking about what are the things that one needs to look at to identify new geographic hubs to spark um, innovation. The second is Douglas Grouse or Doug. He is the, currently the chairman of the board of New York Creates, which uh, partners with um, the SUNY Polytechnic Institute in creating the Northeast Advanced Technological Education Center and does a lot of work on, um, a, or there's a primary focus on workforce development in upstate New York. Our third panelist is Hank Weber, who um, hails from um, Washington University. 
and he will be talking about primarily about the establishment of the Cortex Innovation Community um, and the partnerships that WashU formed with, uh, with local businesses and local workforce and really revitalizing uh, parts of St. Louis. And our final speaker is uh, Barbara Helland, and um, she comes to us from the Department of Engineering, and she is currently the Executive Director of the COVID-19 High Performance Computing Consortium, um, which it was a very rapid international scale response, um, which involved a wide variety of partners from multiple sectors, and she'll be talking about her experience in that area. Wonderful. Uh, thanks very much, Alexander. We we think that the way they've been positioned and uh, and follow each other, there'll be a, a good overlap, I mean, a good interface from one topic to the next. Uh, we had such a robust discussion in each of the dry runs of the the kind of things that we expect from uh, questions from the board, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we didn't uh, cover uh, more than a, a small percentage of the kind of questions that will be raised by. Uh, by their presentations, and we look forward to a very robust discussion. And I want to thank Alexandra and the team at the NSBO for doing such a great job of pulling together because it was, uh, we, we, needed, we needed breath, and I think we got it. Thanks. Thank you, Rani. Any discussions? If not, um, we are all looking forward to the next week's panel and also getting the promotional flyer, which I strongly encourage all of you to share with your networks and once we have it. I've always shared that and then lo local institutions, they show interest in attending them. So now let's talk about the May and August. Hopefully you had a chance to look at in the, your board book uh, about the different panel ideas in the diligent boards. Uh, these panel ideas are based on uh, developed from the board priorities and member conversations in the last few months. So we have a lot of ideas here uh, and some of you we provided that some of which may very timely for this uh, spring for our key stakeholders in Congress and administration. We have two more panel slots available for our year long geography of innovation story arc. Uh, what would be your top choice for May and which would you like to pursue for August? So you all have seen in the board book also. So let, let me open up for some discussions on that. So any thoughts and suggestions on which we should focus in May and August? So I can go through some of the topics in the board books are geography of federal funding and broadening geography of innovation, how EBSCOR helps and what is missing. And then also models of accountability and transparency in higher education, lowering financial barriers, and then socioeconomic status, and then also uh, financial barriers in uh, education and bringing veterans to STEM. And so these are the different topics there and also STEM pathways in a post COVID-19 US landscape. So these are the already there in your board book. So please, uh, any thoughts which we should focus on May? Any, any ideas? I think ahead, as, as you have also seen, um, Suresh, there has been a lot of energy surrounding the topic of, of um, financial barriers and, and socioeconomic status. Um, I, think, I think it really, uh, addressing that topic um, as, as kind of an upfront early um, focus would, would really have a lot of impact. And I think it would, it would um, bring a lot of people to the table who maybe feel at this point that they're not as well represented as they should be. Uh, and it gives us as a board an opportunity to, to, um, to show our real commitment to, to reducing barriers across, across the board for everyone who is facing them with, without any discrimination or, or you know, looking at the real factors that, that actually do inhibit people from moving forward. So I think I would put that forward as, as a priority, a priority topic. Um, and I'd really like to see, see it be addressed sooner in the year rather than later. Thank you, Maureen. Any, okay, Roger, please go ahead. Uh, I wonder, Maureen, if, if, if um, I, mean, I, I agree the topic is the important one, is a terribly important one. I wonder if, if there should be an attempt to 
to identify um, regional issues for which can, which can be addressed then as a prime as a first step, and then identifying uh, the challenges of bringing other STEM workers in those geographics uh, and in this range of geographies that we'd like to see involved and, uh, and, and how we, I mean, should we lay the problem out first and then the solution, which is workforce, it includes workforce. Just a question. If I could just um, kind of in you know, Maureen, I, I like your idea of looking at uh, socioeconomic barriers as well. And there, some of them are ge geographic, but some of them aren't. Um, and uh, um, if we look at um, the, uh, if we if we really dug, I don't I don't know that NSF has the data, but my uh, that's part of the problem. Um, and I don't mean just, you know, we have this tendency sometimes to look at examples rather than what I think as a board member I'd rather do, which is to see what does the data tell us and what are the kinds of things that can scale? What are the strategies or policy changes that need to be made as opposed to just the one or two off, you know, examples of success, which are interesting, but which don't necessarily get us to strategies to change things. My, my suspicion is that if we looked at New York City or even California, you will find that, um, that uh, there's a significant distinction based on wealth as to when, and the wealth of particular universities or even the wealth of students, when you get to them, you know, there is a socioeconomic barrier there. And what is it and what are we doing about it so that we don't end up with a, you know, causing a greater and greater divide in opportunity. Um, so I think there's issues there and I'm, I'm not sure we have the data and that word is meaningful. Yeah, I think, I think you're, you're echoing a concern that has been raised by a number of people most, most uh, consistently by Julia Phillips <laughs> uh, that, that we do really suffer from, you know, no matter how excellent our intentions are, if we don't have, if they're not evidence-based, then, then we're, we're much less likely to be successful. So, you know, one, one possible approach uh, along Roger's lines of, of defining the, the problem, it might be really helpful for the board to hear from people who could advise us on how do we generate this data? You know, what, what would be the most important things for us to know? Um, what has been successful in obtaining that kind of information in a relatively short and cost-effective Short time frame and cost effective manner, um, so that so that we we can start the process of defining the problem based on evidence. Yeah, you know, I, I have to say one of the things that probably people don't want. You know, I so I'm a university president. I know you know what's required in the reports, and all of you have been filled out reports to the NSF. The things we're not required to report are the things that concern me, um, and uh, I. I don't believe in most reports to federal funding entities we're required to say for undergraduates who are being paid on grants, how many of them are Pell eligible? Um, how many are minorities? There are voluntary reports, but that means there's no good data or even US citizens. And that I think we need to be concerned about as well. While it's a global scientific enterprise, these are taxpayer funds. And, uh, and I think there's, a, there's probably a reluctance to push that issue. I, can, I, can un I understand it completely, um, but maybe it's, time that we, uh, maybe it's time that we start to insist. Any other comments? Heather, I think you have a, the round table discussion in Texas too. Is it going to discuss these topics too in March 2nd? Almost certainly no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because universities don't really have an interest in being in a, accountable in that way, honestly, because very few of them do this well. And I think, you know, pulling back this story is, uh, is one that we, if we're ever going to reach people who are not going in, you know, if, if we're going to solve this problem, we have to start out by seeing how 
big the problem is and where it's working and where it's not. And it's not working so many places and nobody wants to say so. So maybe in some panel discussions later on as a part of the NSP meetings in May and August could see how the data can be collected formally or informally. Any other thoughts on it? Uh, well, I, I, I think okay. those are really good points that Heather and Maureen make. And I, I hope we'll raise the, these kind of questions in the upcoming panel because there's a oblique um, recognition of the challenge, Heather. Uh, but but I but not directly addressed and and it might ask if you ask the question you might you might find out individual responses um, and highlight more of the issue additional amounts of the issue. Okay. So speak up at the at the panel. Yeah, I don't know who's good. You know, I I don't know who does this well. And I'll be fully honest, we don't do it well. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we do pretty well on reaching underserved and those kind of things. But as far as being open with ourselves and saying, you know, we know it's voluntary, but as a university, we're going to report it because we think this is important. We don't do that as a university. I don't know if there's anyone who does who could um, tell why they do that. And, um, uh, and, you know, shame the rest of us into starting it or something. I don't know. Thank you, Heather. Roger. So, uh, any, um, so I, we got some ideas to focus on it. I believe then uh, the one of the jaggery of federal funding could be setting the stage, or that's what Roger's thought process. And then finally, Ma, uh, Marine's uh, uh, socioeconomic status could be the probably in August could be staging it like that. Could be that's what I'm hearing understand the problem and come up with a solution by August potential the panels. Did I hear that correctly, Heather? Mm -hmm. right. Okay. okay. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm still yeah. struggling, you know, panels and solutions and how it all actually happens behind the, behind the scenes. But I've never even met any of you personally yet, so I know not of what I speak. Okay. I, I think I think the uh, the office will do will will really research any topic we want to uh, that we want to uh, explore and uh, I mean, it's a great group and and I really don't I don't know either the, uh, the the priority I mean which one ought to be how they ought to be staged. I believe John has a comment. John, go ahead, please. I was just going to note that uh, the issues Heather was raising about uh, data and what universities do and do not report, they've been front and center in a lot of the uh, Committee on Oversight and SEP conversations. Um, and I think the crux of it is the intersect is NSF's administrative data uh, as distinct from the NCSES you know, global data about the scientific enterprise. And that's that's been a increasingly important conversation in a number of board contexts. Ponch, uh, is paying attention to it in new ways. Um, and uh, he has put Alicia Needler in charge of sort of identifying gaps uh, in what we have, what we can request, you know, what are the uh, legal obstacles? Um, where does the uniform guidance from, from OPM play in as an obstacle? So we are going to facilitate some conversations between uh, Alicia and Ponch and, and the board in this space. Uh, so a long way of saying, I completely agree. Thank you for raising it and uh, stay tuned. Thank you, John, I appreciate it. So uh, Nadine and John, I, I don't know the, the uh, mechanics of creating a panel to address this lack of data. I don't know right now, but probably we can think about it in the coming few weeks, or that there's a panel could be arranged. Also. It, it, it may be something that we do with an internal uh, session as well. And we, we have a few NSF experts um, coming to speak to the issue. I don't know if, if the external expertise is going to be what we need. Um, although, Heather, I do appreciate your honesty there about uh, what universities do and do not do uh, well. Um, so that may play into it. Uh, um, just let me chime in for a second, which is not about the administrative data on the NSF side, which, as John said, may be more of an internal conversation. But in the panel uh, proposal sort of ideas document, there is a proposal 
a uh, short one on models of accountability and transparency in higher education for lowering financial barriers, which does get to the point, I th some of the points that Heather, uh, I think, was just raising, um, and possibly kind of bringing in panelists who have, ha uh, from inter inst institutional leaders who have kind of increased transparency um, around those things at their own institutions um, as potentially models for how that might be done more broadly. So that is, so that is uh, that external part of the data and how do we do a better job of getting that kind of data and, and what kind of data is really needed um, that could be folded into that panel. Um, and I think that was the intention of it. Could, could we combine those two panels? Is that too much to ask for one panel? We could certainly put uh, two items in a board meeting side by side would structure a conversation. That'll be not, not to say no to your proposal, just uh, that would strike me yeah. as easy as to have the internal perspective and the external uh, perspective coupled by putting them back to back. Uh, and I, I would just build on that by saying that in the past, sometimes for some of the panels we have had uh, in that back to back kind of way, uh, NSF make a presentation um, about a really, that topic in relation to the panel. So you could imagine a situation where you would do that here, where NSF might talk about its, um, but what we, what you all are interested in asking them, and then you know have that in paired with this uh, models of accountability for higher education, the ex, the external data. One of the things that I've I've heard them answer this question. I've had some side conversations to share some some experience. Um, I I think when the NSF digs into some of its data, some people think that they are getting it all, when in fact, some of their requirements are voluntary reporting. And so they, they, um, uh, they, they have probably some data, but if it's voluntary as to whether, you know, I put in my report to how many undergraduates and how many graduate students were paid off this grant and now, what, uh, uh, how many of them were Pell Grant eligible or how many were, you know, just to get more data on whether we're really reaching, you know, how many of them were U.S. citizens even. And I know that, that that's probably extremely controversial and the lawyers may have something to say about that. But if they are characterizing voluntary reporting as comprehensive data, they're probably making some mistakes. And, and we do, if we don't know where we are, it's hard to change things. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Riba, you do the, in the um, proposal in the board book, we're talking about Georgetown report and some of the programs called out there. We could probably get some people to be part of this panel, could be. Okay, so thank you, Heather. Discussions about the, what May and August. So I will really work with the NSP staff to uh, discuss about what could we could do after this panel in the February. Um, so is there any more discussions on panel or we can move to the next in agenda? So I'm going to look for any hands up, no. But Not, could I just ask, ahead, Roger, uh, go ahead. We, we've, we've tentatively closed this topic off by the end of the August meeting. Um, if this is really an important topic, if there's another topic that we need to drive into the next meeting uh, or to the, to the retreat, um, I think it's it's up to us to decide if that is or is not something we want to do. Are there are these topics sort of the sum total of what we'd like to see, and is there a burning one that's that's left off of the May May August meeting schedule that you want to hear? I, I guess the only answer is I mean let's just let's not consider that we're done just because of the next two just be, as we finish the next two. So. Roger, if I'm hearing that correctly, you think that it may continue on beyond August too. So we are not going to be I, I, on. I think it's up, it's up. Okay. Sorry, it's up to us to decide, I think. And, and, the, and there will be new committee members. I mean, remember we're changing some committee members as well. Agreed, that's correct. So uh, I, I believe, I think it, I, uh, we can continue on beyond if this topic is very current, I think beyond August. I, I'm, I think I, I'm okay with that. How about other board members? What do they think about it? If there's no- and Suresh, I would just, sorry to jump in, but just remind you all that when this committee decided to you know, kind of 
came up with, with, with Jerry with the idea of doing these external panels, a lot of the thinking behind it was to take advantage of the current landscape and to really be nimble and, and seize those opportunities, either looking ahead into the crystal ball or moving forward on, on you know, board vision priorities. Um, and so some of those ideas that the team assembled there, of course, are, that's why it says other considerations and things like that, were with an eye towards exactly that. What's happening at NSF right now? What's happening on the Hill and the White House? What are people talking about? So long way of saying that, you know, you all as the board and, and this committee, you know, have that flexibility. So the story arc doesn't have to end, you know, just some arbitrary time. I agree. So I, including including bringing veterans into STEM education could be another important topic for us too. So. Okay, so please do provide feedback to us. So to the NSB staff and everything as you're going through this, uh, what could be other panel after the February, and then we can walk through identifying the panel members. So uh, this will allow us to refine the ideas also. So I think if there is no other discussion on the panel, I'd like to move to the next in our agenda item. So it may take some of us a little bit more discussions on this. So our, the item is uh, revisiting our NSB's goals for the board's honorary awards. First, I'd like to thank uh, Maureen for her leadership for the awards committee and two years in a row. And she has educated me, which I've been part of that committee too. And um, also, um, featured more publicity and outreach efforts to attract the nominations too. As you know, those efforts did not result in strong nominations for our Vannevar Bush Award this time. So the board decided not to give out that award in 2022 and has charged the committee with taking a fresh look at the board's honorary awards. And also recommended that we come up with the new ways of looking at it in the main meeting. So today is the first step to start the process. How do we go about uh, doing the honorary awards? So in your committee materials, I think you might in the board meeting, you also see a document that summarizes key issues and potential solutions as identified by Marine, Ellen and others also. The document also includes a set of questions we might start exploring today, refine and survey the full board to inform our recommendations. So probably may do it before the meeting too. So if Maureen, uh, Maureen can, can kind of walk us through, please, your thoughts uh, on this. Yes, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have the document in front of me right now. So uh, it's, I have a small screen. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, I, I think- But, can... uh, but I, think, I think the challenges really have been that, um, Although we put a lot more pressure this year into trying to solicit um, a broader range of, of nominations, um, and we had some success. I was I was actually happy to see you know um, nominations coming from universities, for example, that had not previously put anyone forward. Um, I think I think uh, we still did not receive uh, as as many as we would have liked and as high quality as we would have liked. And I'm a little concerned that perhaps um, we are suffering in terms of guidance. You know, we need to we need to provide better guidance to to nominators um, about what we're looking for, um, and perhaps uh, a more streamlined model of what the nomination would entail. I mean, as as you have also experienced, um, Suresh, the the nomination packages are all over the board. Some of them are two pages long, and some of them are fifty pages long. <laughs> And I think I think that um, for many people, they're imagining they they the process is more involved and more complicated than it really needs to be. So you know, I'd like to hear from from others what what might be um, you know if if this has been a concern to you when you have served on this committee, or if you feel that or if you have any ideas about how how. Um, how to provide greater guidance and, and perhaps more structure to, to the actual nomination itself. Any thoughts? Any thoughts? So the, chat, the board book has those issues and potential solutions and then questions I can read out also um, as we go through also. Go ahead, anybody, please? Anybody chime? Okay, Heather, please. Um, this is always a challenge. We have, uh, I think, uh, 
to solicit nominations sometimes because it's always the thing that's in the bottom of everybody's inbox, right? And there are people out there who have done tremendous work, but but it's uh, they're not going to put their own name forward because it, it right. So so I think the question becomes: Is nomination the only way that we want to do this? And and uh, you know, and then you get to well, we can solicit nominations, but if then you've still got to find somebody to put together what they think is a fifty-page proposal, or um, is there a is there a way to to, um, to make this more like a search than it is um, a receipt of applications? Um, to think about you now. Who really deserve? Who really deserves this and, and has earned it? Even if they didn't get one of their colleagues to put their name in the pool. Um, right, right. I think I think that's a really good point, Heather. I mean, I know I know of several people in casual conversations who I thought were fabulous and reached out to them and you know really urged them to to have somebody nominate them. And their universal response was, "Oh, I can't put that much work on somebody else's desk. It seems too self-serving." You know, for me to to you know ask my chairman or ask you know a colleague, would they be willing to do this on my behalf? Um, so that's why I'm I'm concerned about perhaps you know providing better guidance and streamlining streamlining the, the procedures. So it really is like a five page nomination, you know, rather than a fifty page nomination. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Maureen, I, I served on the committee for a year too, and I absolutely agree with with what you've said. I wonder if there could be a, a two-stage approach, mm -hmm. where there would be where there would be um, um, anonymous nominations, self nominations would be blinded. Uh, other, I mean, it, it would be it would would include a bio, a brief bio, two hundred fifty words that somebody sends in, and you say, yeah, yeah, those are the kind of people that we want to know more about. Right. You know, I really I love that idea, Roger. I think. I think first off, if you allowed sort of an anonymous, <laughs> effectively a self nomination mm -hmm. and, and kind of model it a little bit on, you know, RPT procedures, right? The, the candidate could put down, you may contact any of these following people for, and anybody else that you might choose um, to, to solicit a letter of recommendation on my behalf. Um, I, think, I think that would, and if it was short, right? If, yes. if that initial screen was short, and then we had a chance to go through as a committee and say, "Hey, wow, you know these 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 are the people we really would like more information on," um, or if we contacted their their letter writers um, and and then kind of made that first cut based on the enthusiasm of letter writers. What we don't want to do is is have it um, get out that we really don't like these twenty page nominations, um, and I mean that. I don't know what we do, what we care about. Actually, we'd like to make it easy for nominees to for nominations to come in, and whether it's a chancellor or a provost or a department department chair, getting a bio might be the easiest thing. And if they know what we're, yeah, I, I, I'm just thinking about it. It might it might be a, a way to get nominations um, and not, that anonymous way would not um, would not be too too onerous for anyone. To, to put a name in the hat. Sure. Because you could start out with, you know, current position in 250 words and a way exactly. to contact them. And then the committee could, in fact, contact and say, you know, you have been nominated. Could we have a copy of your CV? And, 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 letter, and letters of, yeah, right. But it's more, it's, um, you get a broader net um, uh, without a whole lot of work up front. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. There are some solutions proposed by NSB staff. Also, one which I didn't know is that board has freedom to select someone without formal nomination process. That I didn't know that, and because I didn't know the legacy knowledge about that also. Uh, Nadine or John, you can comment on that. Uh, has it been done in the past also? So I don't know that it's it hasn't been done since I've been around, which is going on nine years. But but I, you know this is this struggle is it's a chronic one <laughs> that you are you all are dealing as you know. And I I I served for three years helping support the the, the committee that was doing this. And and so you know at one point you know Anne Bushmiller, our our, our lawyer of course um, pointed out you know there's this is the board's award 
It set up this whole nomination structure because it wants to, you know, have the external community participate in this and suggest things, but there's nothing stopping the board from just saying, hey, this year, you know what we want, I'm just making this up, we want to recognize, you know, Fauci or something. Um, that, that just because you didn't get a nomination doesn't mean that you wouldn't be able to do that, should you want it to do that, right? Um, so, but this, so the, so what you're on, what your, your idea that you're talking about right now, um, you know, is, is kind of like that in, in that make it, make it even easier for, for you all to be made aware of who all you might want to consider. Right. So. And I, I think another point that, that is kind of related to that, why we've, we've asked if um, John, for example, would be willing to, to sit in on this meeting. Um, Kind of institutional memory is really important. I mean, we've had a lot of candidates who had a lot of discussion and who look and who are extremely accomplished and, and very, very deserving in some respect. And yet, you know, when it came to the board, the full board, there were concerns that had to do with history that, that none of us sitting on the committee were aware of. And so, so having, having both the institutional memory to propose potential people that, that might be worthy and also to raise any concerns um, before it um, becomes, goes too far down the road <laughs> regarding an, an individual, that, that would be extremely helpful. So I would like to propose um, uh, if, if everyone seems to, we, we all seem to be centering on this notion that streamlining the procedure and perhaps having a pre a pre-package submission that's very short and very, um, you know, allows us to screen individuals and, and pursue those who we would really like to have more information about. Um, but we would need to think a little bit about what, what information we'd ask um, either self-nominators or, or other nominators to submit regarding candidates. What would be most helpful? Thank you. Or you know, I should go ahead. Is, go is, ahead. There, is there a, um, a financial award or anything that goes along with this, or is it just the honor? It's just, it's an honorary award. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have an outstanding teaching award in Texas that um, is very competitive, um, but uh, it also comes with a, a fairly modest um, financial award, um, but it, um, it, it, it means that every university has an applicant every year. Yeah. Um, is there is there any possibility for digging up some money out of the board's budget to actually put some skin in this game? I, I don't know, Marine. I, I think its question is directed at John probably, but what I was told is by legacy, this is supposed to be a honorary award. This is kind of coveted award. It's not, it doesn't have any financial uh, one because people would be proud to get this. So let me pause. John and Nadine, you can comment on it. No doubt, MacArthur are also really honors, but there's also a stipend that goes along with it, and and uh, um, sometimes it goes to the institution, or even if it goes to the, you know, well, there's a variety of ways to do. Thank you, John. Any any comments on that, please? If it were to come out of the board office's appropriation, which has been flat for a decade, um, that would be challenging. It depends on the magnitude of the award, of course. Um, you know, within NSF as a whole, I don't know if there are statutory limitations. I know that the foundation has specific uh, authorization from Congress and appropriations for the Waterman Awards. Um, so that's the Congressional Act. We might need a similar language uh, for a board award, but there's no reason that the board couldn't ask Congress for it. And mm. it's for a good purpose and a, a um, I get it. Timing is uh, inconvenient for this conversation right now, insofar as there is an authorization bill in conference uh, as we yes. speak, um, but we can play a long game as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. And, and the only other thing you could think, I mean, I off the top of my head, don't have any suggestions for you, but you know, are there other ways that you could raise the appeal and the value to the people you're trying to recognize with these beyond just the honor? Is there some other piece that isn't monetary? that, you know, out of the box that creatively thinking that might really ramp up the appeal. Mm. Thank you. And also there's one other potential solution, Maureen and uh, also talked about is that 
this becomes responsible to the overall e committee not a subcommittee also and then uh, send a like a pre list of people to the whole board and then before the board meeting so such a way that streamlining this process would uh, reduce the amount of uh, way to get to an award so that's also was discussed any thoughts on it yes i think i think um these these are all conversations that that i had with the boards uh the the NSBL staff after after our experience this year, um, I I really feel like having this be a subcommittee really limits. Um, you know, if one person has to recuse themselves because of some conflict, it it puts a tremendous amount of pressure onto the remaining people to to be the deciders, so to speak. Um, it isn't a huge amount of work, and I think if we could streamline it for the for the nominators, it, we would also streamline it for the entire um, EE committee. And I think, I think it's worth entertaining that, that this just be an EE function rather than a subcommittee sub function. That's great, thank you. Any discussions on that? I think that's a, I think it's a, fair, re, I think that's a fair request, Marie. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fair request. Um, if somebody needs to chair it, but uh, and sure. man through it, but, but the discussion mm -hmm. might, might lead to a better understanding of no, let's not go forward this year, or or let's let's dig farther. I mean, take it off of two people's back. I... Okay. So, uh, Marine, and, and and we can kind of consider ask the board in the February meeting about this to see whether all agree with that to become an EE committee's responsibility. We can ask that also. Mm -hmm. And there is one other comment I received from different board members is. The Van Bush Award should it be like a like a last award you get in your career, or showing the yes. potential also, and that way we can get diverse nominations, not only people who are senior most in their career, and that was a discussion also. Any thoughts on that? Well, we got a lot of pushback this year. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, diversity of opinion <laughs> among uh, the members of the full board regarding what the Vanderbilt Bush Award should be recognizing. Is it, is it, is it a capstone award for a career that's been exemplary um, or is it, is it an accomplishment award which could potentially go to a very energetic younger person who has just done amazing things and will probably continue to do those things. Um, uh, th there aren't very many capstones, and there are yeah. a lot. There, there are a number of other uh, intermediary awards that that, that recognize people. Um, do do we have? A, do we have? Does not the NSF have? We have career development awards and so forth um, for the innovators. Now, we're not privy to some of those. Uh, oh, I mean, we're not part of that. So, not not part of that. But we do have the other awards that that are that do recognize those up and comers. Right, I I have to confess my bias has been capstone. You know, I think I think it, it's it's a prestigious award. It's, um, I even think the name of it sort of evokes this legacy of Van der right. and, and how he has exactly. you know he has he has really uh, changed science as in in a retrospective kind of perspective you know when you look back on what he accomplished it's it's really quite quite amazing and I think I think because of that my my own personal bias has always been to see it as as someone that we can look at who has that kind of stature you know a person who at the end of their career has really changed their field changed the way we do things um, and as, as Roger says there's plenty of encouragement along the way for for young go-getters <laughs> Yeah, that's great. So there is one other topic I'd like to bring because Noreen uh, on the awards committee, so I'd like to bring it because of we have a few 10 minutes to go. So I'd like to put that in front of all of you. So uh, and one other idea is to consider a third honorary award, one with that recognize broader impactsman achievements, such as delivering research benefits to society, which is a vision 2030 priority. This actually idea came from Ann Bushmiller and Portia Flowers, uh, who support the committee on oversight. So if there is the idea of interest, staff will draft a proposal, what that could look like. Uh, what do you all think about that, this third honorary award? Hmm. Say, say, that once, say that once again. 
the it's Correct. the Jude Hunter Award would focus on recognizing broader impact achievements, uh -huh. such as delivering research benefits to society, which is a Vision 2030 priority. What do you what do you all think about it? I'd like us to be able to get the Vannevar Bush Award kind of right, and certainly if, if that whoever earns that award should have had broader impacts on society from their work, it would seem to me. But I, I think if we if we're going to change the process, figure out how to get more on that, changing that and getting that right is probably enough to do initially without foreclosing. You know the possibility, particularly if we're getting if we're getting hundreds of really great people put forward. If we start to see that, then there's the question of okay, is there a is it, you know are there is there more than one thing we want to do? But I don't think that's the problem right now. I I would I would agree with Heather. I think I think in my experience, um, having looked at many of these nominations, we are getting a lot of people who have had broader impacts um, and. And uh, I think I think what we're we're struggling with is kind of the higher end of, of the spectrum. Uh, and uh, I, I I would be hesitant to put forward a new award when we still have so many bugs in this one. You know, when if, I think if we can work this out and we have a year or two running where you know we we just have an embarrassment of riches and you know so many fabulous nominations, um, and well then at that point we might want to broaden out and and perhaps offer um, you know or, or create a new award that. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's something that we might expect from or maybe from Tip, the new director, right in the in the future in ten years to say, yeah, who are the so, best. So I'm going to I'm going to propose um, and and this can just be discussed at the full board, perhaps what I would like to see is a change in the nomination procedure where maybe we put greater clarity in terms of what what's going to be required, um, you know, along with suggested things like, you know, two to three letters of recommendation, a one to two page summary of, you know, accomplishments, right, <laughs> something, something in that line. Um, I would suggest that we have an anonymous um, uh, sort of first stage nomination so people can nominate themselves. And I would like to see included in that um, a very brief summary of, of what, you know, how their accomplishments meet the goals of the award. So 250 words. I would like a short list of potential letter writers, maybe three, you know, that can be expanded. And perhaps a you know, in, at the NIH, we have bio sketches, right? One to two page abbreviated CVs, right? With just the highlights, selected CVs that, that highlight not your 70,000 publications, but the elements of your career that, that are germane to the award itself. And having that be something that perhaps in most cases would be generated by the candidate, I think will make it much more focused will make the jobs of the letter writers much easier <laughs> and will allow us to evaluate those people with a very small packet of information. So that would be my, my suggestion. Thank you, Mary. I, before I get, John has this in his hand, it, Mary, and thank you. Uh, in, John, any comments with reference to that or? I, no, I, I like the process proposals. I wanted to, to speak to the BI uh, piece, the broader impacts piece. Um, Right now, the criteria for the award include uh, both things that could be called intellectual merit, that is pushing and advancing the frontiers of knowledge, and things that could be called broader impacts, that is benefits to society. Uh, it does not require uh, either or both, um, but you may want to think about that as you think about clarifying the criteria. Do you want both, or is a purely intellectual accomplishment sufficient for the award? Um, and it was in that spirit that we, we thought that the discussion of a second award had merit uh, if you were also seeking to clarify the criteria for the current award. No argument about trying to get this one right before we <laughs> expand the portfolio, so to speak. Thank you, John. So any questions on Maria's proposal that we have a very succinct way to move forward on it? What about other board members? Any thoughts on it with that proposal? We can take it, we can fine, fine tune it before February or May meeting and then get it to the full board, hey, this is what we are proposing to do. Yeah, okay. I like it. Okay, great. Heather, great. Matt? Okay, did I miss out anybody else? 
So Nadine, it looks okay. Is there any information you need from the board members to start that proposal or? Um, I let you know when I, but I don't think so. I think it's pretty clear uh, okay. what, what people are looking for. I mean, I think my only question is, um, you know, when you looked at that, that little document that we uh, pulled together trying to uh, incorporate Maureen and Ellen and other people's feedback, do you, do you envision working more on this or do you envision this is the recommendation and this is just how you want to move forward now? In other words, you know, do you want to spend more time uh, working this through? Like, should we plan on another, you know, meeting sometime soon? Uh, well, after February, obviously. Right. That's what I'm not clear on. Is um, you know, I think some of that would depend on how on, on what the full board thinks. I mean, this is a it's a pretty. Um, I mean, we the, we the NSB are producing these awards. I mean, we are. It's not just our committee that that is honoring individuals, and so I think getting impact. Uh, are getting um, getting input from from a broader range of individuals about the ideas that that have been floated um, would would probably be valuable. And then I think a short meeting after after the February meeting might might give us a, you know a, a more um, focused direction. Where to go from? Thank you. That's helpful. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, one additional thought. I I did see the letter that. Um, that uh, Ponch sent around that really kind of described and, and was very helpful in, in saying how we think about this award. Um, because uh, not only, you know, I think all of us then, at least I did, I sent that out to all my colleagues who said not only in my university, but these various networks um, so that, uh, that we can, but if there's a follow-up letter that makes it very easy to, you know, to, to, so we've, we've streamlined the, the uh, process and um, so that, you know, step one is very simple. It's not intended to be consuming and so forth um, to cast a wide net. Uh, that might be another, a second communication that would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was very effective too. And I would, I would favor putting, you know, that up on the nomination page on, you know, as, as a way that, people when they're trying to get context and think about it and, and ask, well, am I suitable for this, for this award or not? You know, that might be very helpful. It's really easy online and, you know, upload the CV in 250 words and their points of contact in yours and some suggested letters. If we, the easier we make it in that first step, I think the better off we'll be. Great. So Heather and Maureen, I think we can kind of float this as a, a straw man proposal. I don't know whether we have a time in the February meeting, uh, probably we can say that this is what you are thinking about it and then send a straw man proposal to the board later. Uh, Nadine, is that looks okay, uh, the timing wise? I think so, right? Because right now you only have, you have a 10 minute report out to kind of hit. Yeah. So you could, you could tease it up and just say, look for this will be, you know, the committee will be sending you a straw man proposal. My email. Yeah, I think that worked fine. Thank you. So we are one minute to six o'clock. Uh, so and if, is there any other discussion? If not, I'd like to move to the closure of the meetings today. Any other hot bucket top, top items we need to discuss? Anything? If not, thank you for this discussion because Maureen and I, thank you for taking care of this. We can move forward on it and see, hope to get a lot more nominations by this, uh, at least by next year's one uh, award selection also. So thanks for everyone. And uh, I'm going to ask for, is there any other business we have to take care? There is no show of hands. So that means uh, we concluded, so there is no other business. So this concludes the open session of the external engagement committee and it is adjourned and time is 6 p.m. exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. See you all, okay? Cheers. Okay.